Here we go. Uh, pass my business cards around so that if anybody ever wants to send me an email, pass them around. And there's one person out when he comes back, give him one. Yes, yeah. What's the awkward? <laughs> he literally just went like this because he wanted food. <laughs> Mr. Wakefield, you didn't have your breakfast, didn't you? <laughs> I did have breakfast. I just had breakfast like seven hours ago. So. That's not breakfast, man. That was a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> what? This is seven hours ago. Come on in. Is this a seminar? Yeah, come on in. Uh, there is uh, the business card that uh, you can grab at the end. Okay. Do we need more business cards, Rob? Uh, no, hand me. I have uh, there. Here. Pass them out. Okay. Okay. Rob, hand these out. Take take them out and hand them out. Hand and make sure everybody gets one. Did this gentleman get one? How about the gentleman over there? I got one. Well, thanks for coming today. And uh, today, today's presentation is kind of unique. This is related to electromagnetic excitation. And according to Dr. Bess, uh, we have a sufficient energy that we can collect from our environment. And this is somewhat related to uh, the course that we are taking right now. And uh, before he can start presentation, let me give you as brief introduction as possible and uh, then uh, he can have more time for presentation. He graduated from John Hop Johns Hopkins uh, with a PhD in mathematics in 1955. And he was a Woods Scholar uh, a few years earlier. And uh, one more important thing is that he had a personal meeting with Dr. Einstein for 15 minutes. Yeah, well, there was one other man, but the other man sat silent. So, so I can say I was alone with Einstein for 15 minutes. <laughs> and for that, here's uh, uh, Dr. Bass. And uh, before we can even present, let me just give you a, this a video clip so that you can see what the, uh, the Schumann resonance is all about. Yeah. Should we turn on the light? Uh, I don't think it's going to help that much. As you can see, there is a lightning anywhere around the globe. There will be 44 lightning each second. And once you have a lightning, the wave is going to be propagating around the Earth and becomes resonance. And according to this calculation, the energy is just enormous, OK? Much more than what you consume every year, OK? So that's it for that, Dr. Bass. Let's see. Okay, you can just yeah, click this one. Yes. Time. All right. Yes. 
Um, before I actually begin, I want to tell a little joke that's very relevant, and you can edit it out if you don't like the joke. Uh, how many people here have heard of cold fusion? One guy. Okay, C meaning cold nuclear fusion. It came out 24 years ago and very controversial. Well, uh, about 15, 20 years ago, uh, the most distinguished alumnus of Ohio State University bypassed the chairman of the physics department. He went to the president of the university. He says, I want you to invite Dr. Bass to talk to us about cold fusion. And so when I came there, there was a nice luncheon, and the man who'd got me invited, uh, he was there, and the whole faculty was there. And they said, the reason we invited you to this luncheon is we want to tell you face to face why we are none of us coming to your lecture and why we have ordered all of our students not to come to your lecture. Because if we let our students hear you talk about cold fusion, they would become unemployable. OK. Now, uh, I call that the OSU syndrome because that was Ohio State University. The, the chairman of the physics department was afraid his students would become unemployable if they listened to me. What I'm going to say today is even more controversial, so I have to warn you, uh, you be careful whom you let know that you have thought about this, or you might become unemployable. OK. Now. Uh, Yes, see, now, uh, okay, uh, any who didn't get my business card, ask my son over in the corner. He has a lot of business cards he can pass out. So I would like to hear by email from anyone who's interested because I can send you copies of technical papers. Uh, for instance, here's one, satellite observation of Schumann resonances in the Earth's ionosphere. Here's another one, review and evaluation of lightning return stroke models, including some aspects of their application. And these are all uh, well funded by National Aeronautics and uh, uh, Space Administration, NASA. And then, of course, uh, this is a very classical book. Uh, you, probably Professor Lee has told you about it, Classical Electrodynamics by John David Jackson, who's at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And he does have several pages on the Schumann resonances in this book, and I'll show you a formula from this book later on. But I would like to tell you another joke. I contacted him, and he knew my email address, and I said I would like to get you involved in this business. And he wrote me back, and he says, life is too short for quixotic adventures. <laughs> so my, my uh, email address is Don Quixote, uh, RWB for my initials. So he, he thought, um, uh, one of my bosses uh, accused me of having a Don Quixote complex, so that's why I used it for my email address. Don Quixote, OK. Now, here are some of the books that I would advise you if you get very interested in this. The most valuable book is John E. Morey. He's the son of T. Henry Morey, and it's called The Sea of Energy in Which the Earth Floats. Now, Morey himself discovered limitlessly renewable free energy, but he may have un misunderstood where it came from. He, uh, but anyway, this book, you can buy it from a company called XLIBRIS, Ex Libris, and the book has a new introduction. It was reprinted in a 1930 book, uh, and it has a new foreword by me on page uh, whatever. Anyway, there's a foreword by me, and it also has a new conclusion by me. So uh, I think that adds a little credibility to my talking on the subject, because I know the son of Moray. He was a teenager when Moray made his big discoveries, but he always watched his father. If he was a good boy, the, the mother would let him watch his father at work. If he was a bad boy, they would punish him by saying, you can't watch your father. So anyway, uh, this is the sea of energy in which the earth floats. Now, here's a lot of books about it. This one has the scientist, the madman, the thief, and their light bulb. And it, uh, one person says it's the biggest scandal in the history of science. The biggest scandal in the history of science. Um, then here's another book that has a whole lot of papers on uh, Moray and other things. 
uh, Tesla and also, and I'll uh, mention why Tesla is in the picture. Oh, here's what uh, I call them. I don't call them the Schumann resonances. I call them the Fitzgerald Tesla Schumann resonances. Now, in the book, he says, well, it's amazing that the great genius Tesla discovered these things 50 years before Schumann. Tesla discovered them experimentally. He revealed them in a patent application that he applied for in 1895, but the patent wasn't issued until 1905. So Tesla is a second discoverer. But if you go to this man's website, it's not in the book, but in his website where he has errata for the book, misspellings and stuff, he says, somebody brought to my attention that this was published in England in 1893 by Fitzgerald, who published it in Science. So I call him the Fitzgerald Tesla Schumann Resonances. Now here's a couple of popular books that have chapters about Moray. Breakthrough Power by Gene Manning and Joel Garbon, and The Coming Energy Revolution by Gene Manning. They have chapters on it. But she has the best chapter of all about this stuff um, in, in this big, thick book here. Uh, she copied a lot of, uh, out of uh, Moray's own book. This is a book on suppressed inventions. And she has a whole chapter called Gunfire in the Laboratory. And if you read it, it's like a thriller because uh, uh, people really tried to murder him. They would phone up and tell his wife, uh, you tell your husband to quit or we'll kill you. And she's driving around the road and a bullet whistles by. They deliberately missed her, so he got bulletproof glass on his car. So they tried to frighten him into quitting and so on and so on. Now, here's another book that is anyone who gets real interested needs to get this book, although I have great respect for the author. He passed all the... Uh, requirements for a PhD except a thesis, but I would happily nominate him for an honorary PhD because of all the work he's done on the subject. However, with respect, I don't agree with him of where Moray was getting the free energy, and here's the difference between him and me. Um, if you study quantum mechanics, you find out why a crystal, even at zero, you cool it down until you arbitrarily close to zero, everything trembles a little bit. And everything trembles a little bit and they call that zero-point energy. Now, you've probably heard of the famous Nobel Prize winner uh, Feynman, F-E-Y-N-M-A-N, Feynman. And Feynman famously said, if you take your cupped hands and you look at the volume in your cupped hands and you've got a vacuum anywhere in the whole universe, the volume of your cupped hands, there's enough zero-point energy there that if you could extract it, you could boil all the oceans on the Earth. So there's limitless uh, uh, energy in the zero point. Now, this guy, Maury B. King, he got interested in the stuff of Maury because he had an unusual first name, and Maury has an unusual last name. So he thought, oh, that means I should study his stuff. He thinks Maury was getting the energy from the zero point. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he is getting it from the zero point. I think he was getting it from the Fitzgerald Tesla Schumann resonances. But I could be wrong. Well, let me tell you my definition of a true scientist. A true scientist is one who holds every proposition with a light grasp, ready to surrender it upon encountering new evidence or better arguments. So everything I'm telling you, it could be wrong. I'm <laughs> just, you know, you've got to think for yourself. Oh, that's what Einstein used to say. Uh, he, I was at a party of 32 Rhodes Scholars. I was alone with Einstein for 15 minutes. And then the director of the Rhodes Scholarship thought I was unfair to the other 31 Rhodes Scholars, so he had a sailing party, and he invited Einstein as the guest of honor. And so we were all there for a few hours with Einstein, and then it was time for us to leave. And so the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, a man named Fra Frank Adelot, who was secretary of the American Rhodes Scholars, he said, now, Einstein, do you have any parting advice for these young men? And Einstein thought, and he said, well, if I could give the young men any advice, it would be this. Don't believe anything is necessarily true just because you read it in the newspapers or hear it on the radio. Always think for yourself. Now, um, I asked Einstein to autograph a book for me, and he never did it. But as a special favor, he did autograph that book. And it was sitting on my shelf when I was at uh, Hughes Aircraft Company. And I had 12 PhDs working for me. And one of them piped up at a staff meeting. And the secretary was there. And he said, you shouldn't leave that book with Einstein's autograph in the shelf. It's valuable. And guess what? The next morning, it was gone. 
So either one of the 12 PhDs or the secretary stole it. Uh, but I know how to get it back because if I go to New York and say I want an authenticated Einstein autograph and there's probably only one in the world, they got to show me the provenance and I'll trace it back to one of those men or the secretary. But anyway, uh, I did bring you something to show about Einstein and that is uh, get your library to get this wonderful book here. Uh, it's called uh, Einstein, the Life of a Genius by Walter I Isaacson. Now he has another book that's just thick, standard type book, but this is not a standard type book. This book here has fold out, uh, you can pull out things which are actually uh, perfect duplicates of the original documents. This is just fascinating stuff. You can see the letter that uh, uh, Leo Zillard wrote a letter to uh, President Roosevelt uh, alerting him to the possibility of an atomic bomb and he, uh, a, a man I consider my friend, uh, Eugene Wigner, I knew him at uh, Princeton, he was a Nobel laureate, uh, Wigner drove the car with Zillard and they went to Einstein's summer home near New York and they showed Einstein the letter and he signed it and then they knew some financier who took it to President Roosevelt and that started the atomic bomb. And so they have the original letter here from the Zillard that Einstein signed. They have all that stuff. A fascinating book. Get your library to get it. Okay. Now, here's another book. The Tesla Papers. Nikola Tesla on free energy and wireless transmission of power. Now, I think Tesla was deceiving himself. Tesla discovered the Schumann resonances, but he thought he could put energy in and take energy out. And Tesla's plan was he was going to get the energy from Niagara Falls and he was building a big tower and he was going to put it into the Schumann resonances and the people in England could take it out. So he thought he could transmit wireless transmission of power. But I think Tesla was deceiving himself because I think the same amount of energy is there all the time and if the people get it out in England it's not because he put it in here at Niagara Falls. It's because the energy, as you saw from that graph, it's just all over the world. Okay, so that's another one of the books. And um, I think I've showed all the books now, so maybe we'll move on with uh, uh, my talk. Um, oh, yeah, there's one other book. Uh, this is very important. Uh, Beyond Oil and Gas, The Methanol Economy by uh, George Ola and his associates, Jeffrey and Prakash. And uh, Ola is a chemist who won the Nobel Prize and what he says in this book is if there was a cheap way of getting solar energy you could take water and air and create methanol you could replace all the gasoline that everybody drives in their automobiles by methanol and when you drive down the road the methanol gets converted into water and carbon dioxide and so what you started with uh, goes back and the amount of carbon dioxide that goes into the air from your automobile is the same amount that was taken out to make the methanol, so it's carbon neutral. So now, when I told Gene Manning, the author of one of these books, that I was going to advocate the methanol economy, she said, oh no, because it'll take fresh water away from people who, who uh, have all over the world is a fresh drinking water problem. Well, I studied it last night, and he does say in here, that doesn't say it work in the com uh, internal combustion engine, but he says, if you did it in a um, um, some kind of a catalyzer that made electricity while you're driving, w what would come out would be perfectly water and carbon dioxide. And so there is a way of doing it, um, uh, not with an internal combustion engine, but with some other kind of engine. I've forgotten the name of it, but you could replace your automobile. And then it also says if you're not worried about using up the water for a while, uh, you, very very small changes in everybody's automobile would make it work on methanol instead of gasoline. So anyway, now my first slide. Uh, uh, oh yes, you told me to. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, you, you told me to uh, put. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, that's the title of the talk, and that's uh, my contact information, and I have business cards. If anybody wants to contact me, I'm glad to send them copies of these technical papers. So now, uh, 
Is there a way to freeze the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere without rendering the present transportation infrastructure obsolete? Nobel laureate chemist George Ola has already written a book on the methanol economy, which I had up. If a completely green source of renewable energy becomes available, such as hyper-efficient solar energy, then atmospheric carbon dioxide plus water can be converted to methanol as a replacement for gasoline. But the carbon dioxide released by combustion of the methanol merely replaces that taken out to produce it. So the total amount of carbon dioxide remains unaltered, and concern regarding global warming disappears. So I have been trying for two years to contact Al Gore and saying, uh, uh, Nobel laureate, P he got the Peace Prize, Nobel laureate uh, Gore, uh, here is your holy grail. It was discovered in 1926 and it was lost in 1939, but if it was rediscovered, you wouldn't worry. <clears throat> okay. Uh, now, this here says incontrovertible evidence of a magic bullet solution to free renewable clean energy problem was demonstrated before Nobel laureate physicists and chemists 1923 to 1940, but was lost because the United States Patent and Trademark Office mistakenly said, a cold cathode is physically impossible, and denied a patent to T.H. Moray's germanium triode. I'll show you a picture later of his patent application he applied in 1927 and uh, it was rejected in uh, 1929. Uh, but uh, that's only part of his problems. Uh, but uh, in the book uh, written by Morey and then re-edited and reissued by his son that I showed you, uh, he says quite plainly that uh, uh, Morey disclosed every single thing that he knew to two or three people and one of the people that he disclosed was uh, Harvey Fletcher. And so the fact that two of Harvey Fletcher's subordinates invented the transistor seems to me circumstantial evidence that finally Fletcher got so frustrated that he broke Moray's confidence. I don't want to defame anybody unjustly. I'll just say that a lot of Moray's friends think that. And Moray himself says, no, no, I don't suspect Fletcher. He's an honorable man. But it sure seems to me pretty suspicious that Moray showed Fletcher a rejected patent on a germanium triode, and then he, that was in 1927, and then in 1939, uh, Fletcher started a project on solid state physics at the Bell Telephone Laboratories, and in 1940, it says 1947, that's wrong, 1948, they announced the transistor, but the definition of the transistor was a piece of germanium and two gold strips. And I just think it's too much of a coincidence. But uh, I don't want to uh, slander Fletcher, so it could be just a coincidence. But I think it's suspicious. Now, uh, this says a startling new development. I have to qualify this. It says, a uh, miniaturized partial rediscovery of the lost secret of the Moray device was confirmed by 4,000 hobbyists. Well, it's true that 4,000 hobbyists a couple of years ago bought a manual that told them how to do it. And the person that was selling the manual, he said to me, I sent a letter to all of them and did, if anybody said it doesn't work, write me back. And he said, not a one of them wrote me back. And, but yet I never could get the name of a single person who bought the manual and tried it and, and said, yeah, it worked. So a friend of mine who I, I wrote an appendix for his book, which was a bestseller, and at the time he was uh, quite affluent, he gave me $1,000 and he said, you pay $1,000 to some expert in uh, electrical engineering and electronics to duplicate what it says in this manual. And so at the time I was in communication with a professor at, um, uh, I don't know whether it's Denver University or University of Denver, but uh, they advertise that they're the Catholic University for independent thinkers. And the person who ran their electronics laboratory actually was a Methodist or something, but anyway, I paid this guy $1,000 and he followed the thing and he says, yeah, it works, but it doesn't give uh, 2.5 watts. It, it, it gave me something like a, a milliwatt. So, it, uh, so when we say that, uh, th that this Hungarian 
um, has duplicated it, that's questionable. Because, uh, when I asked the publisher who sold 4,000 copies of the manual, he says, it was a fixed price. I gave the Hungarian the money, he gave me the thing, and then he disappeared. So we can't track down the Hungarian who claims that he did it. But I have something which is much more scientific uh, to approach all this stuff, and that's why I'm glad I met Professor Lee. Um, I have a patent issued and now expired, uh, and a anybody who sends me an email, I can uh, send you a copy of the patent. Equation 10.29 in that patent, um, uh, I just say how to derive it, but I don't give the actual coefficients. Uh, I showed them to my friends at the time, and we had them. It, it implicitly explains in the patent how to derive these, I say they're hellaciously complicated algebra, that is true. Um, and what I call them, uh, it, uh, it says somewhere here, but it's uh, got one letter left off. Uh, I call it the uh, EMTFD equations, electromagnetothermofluid dynamics, uh, EMTFD, the EMTFD equations. And I worked them out uh, since um, 1960, uh, let's see, since 1960 to the present time. I've worked them out and written them on a piece of paper. They fill six lines, ordinary size type, doesn't go the whole way across, about a third of a page. And I've shown them to people, and I've lost them three times. And my friends said, don't admit you ever lost them. They'll think you're stupid. Well, I'm, I lost them. Anyway, uh, the first time I did it, 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 it you're expanding a six by six determinant. And it took me 200 hours a year for five years. I was doing only great big sheets of paper. And the second time I did it, uh, I had a, a MATLAB symbolic algebra engine of a, of a crude type. And I would type in a formula, and it would say, that string is too long. So I would have to call it A and B, and type in A, and then type in B, and then type in A plus B. And it took me hundreds of hours of typing, but it didn't take thousands of hours. And so I printed out the six formulas, and then I put them on a page, and I sent them to two people. Only two people have tried to do it, but they got wrong answers. And in my patent, I pointed out the algebraic mistakes they made. There's a famous professor uh, at MIT named Bruno Coppi, C-O-P-P-I. And so I joke, I sent a copy to Coppi. And I mailed him a copy of the six formulae to sort of nudge him, you know, you made an algebraic mistake, but here's the right answer. And I also mailed a copy to an application for a job in the plasma physics laboratory at MIT, but I didn't get the job. And when I went back to them and said, I lost the page, please give it to me, and they said, we lost the page too. <laughs> so so uh, uh, anyway, uh, I'm trying to do it for the third time, and I'm making great progress because technically, I'm a candidate for a master's degree in electrical engineering at Florida Institute of Technology, where I taught systems engineering for 10 years at night when I was in Maryland from 1998 to 2007. And I audited uh, courses on electrical engineering given by my friend George Masters, Dr. George Masters, who had recommended they hire me. I audited his courses. I had to pay taxes on getting the courses free, but I did audit his courses and I got credit for all those courses. So all I have to do is submit a master's thesis that he approves and I will get a master's degree. And so because technically I'm a candidate, I was able to get a cheap copy of MATLAB instead of two or 3,000 for two or 300, I got it. And so uh, in my spare time at home, I have been trying to do this work again for the electromagnetothermofluid dynamic equation, EMTFD, to get the six degree polynomial. And the important thing about the six degree polynomial is it factors into three quadratic equations. Now, here's the importance of the three quadratic equations. Two of them are generalizations of something already known, but when uh, Alfven, A-L-F-V-E-N, he derived them, he took one over C, where C is the velocity of light. He took one over C equal to zero. He assumed light was infinite, and it's not. In my version, one over C is positive. So I have a generalization of the two quadratic polynomials that Alfvén derived. He called their solutions the slow magnetosonic waves and get the roots of the other one. That's the fast magnetosonic waves. OK, I have got a more accurate version of the slow and the fast magnetosonic waves of Alfvén. 
And if he deserved a Nobel Prize for those two polynomials, then I ought to deserve a Nobel Prize, perhaps, for the third quadratic problem, which doesn't give you the magnetosonic waves. It gives you the electromagnetosonic waves. And that, that's what I really think we need to know in order to design an antenna to tap into the moray, uh, well, the, uh, I think, uh, the uh, Fitzgerald, Tesla, Schumann resonances. If you did it conventionally, a quarter wavelength antenna, it would be 200 kilometers long. But Moray used an antenna that was 90 yards long. But there were some strange things about what Moray did, which I really don't understand. And those are explored at length in this book here by Moray King, The Energy Machine of T. Henry Moray. And he says, uh, well, I tried to interest a Nobel Prize winner in physics in this stuff once. And he says, look, if somebody was getting 3,500 watts, uh, through a little thin wire, it would be red hot and it would be corona discharge and everything, but everybody said the wire was cold. And another weird thing, it has photographs here in this book, um, uh, Maury would say cut the wire and, and the wire's coming down and they cut it and he would put a sheet of plate glass here and the current would go through the plate glass and still lit up. He had a bank, a 35, a uh, 7 by a, a, a uh, seven rows and five columns where he had light bulbs and uh, he would get uh, three or four thousand watts with the light bulbs but he also lit up uh, a waffle iron and a motor so he was getting between 3,500 and 5,000 watts. His son who's now 83 years old told me that eventually he got it up to 50,000 watts. So somewhere Moray was getting the energy. I think he was getting it from the Fitzgerald Tesla Schumann resonances but I could be mistaken, of course. Uh, now, uh, uh, I've already said this. In 1926, Tesla Observer, T. Henry Moray, stunned credential witnesses by producing 25 kilowatts of AC power 26 miles from the nearest power line using a short antenna plus a germanium triode decades before transistors. Now, here's a picture of Tesla, and this is... Uh, Tesla with his, one of his uh, uh, lightning producers, but people say this is really a, a double exposure that uh, Tesla photographed himself there and then he went out and photographed it again with the lightning coming uh, and uh, so apparently it's a double exposure. But anyway, uh, I'm showing you this next thing. It may or may not be worthwhile. How much time do I have left? Uh, you have about 30 more minutes. Th 30. 30 minutes? Okay, okay, I'll tell you why I'm showing this, even though it may be worthless. I'm showing you this to prove that I did, in fact, tend to several of the Tesla conferences in the 1980s. I, I would spend my spare time thinking about the Moray thing, and then I went to a Tesla conference and I heard all these people speak, and I have some of the uh, proceedings of some of the Tesla conferences here. But um, in order to justify going, I did give a paper myself. Now my paper may or may not be worthwhile, and I'll explain to you why it may or may not be worthwhile, but if you look at section 11, self-sustained longitudinal waves by me, Dr. Robert Bass. Okay, now here's why it's a, a challenge. Every book on electromagnetism says there is no self-sustained oscillation that's a solution of Maxwell's equations in which the E field and the B field are going in the same direction. They said it's impossible. Well, I proved it's not impossible. I got a rigorous mathematical solution, but there's a catch. And the catch is, look at the geometry of my longitudinal self-sustained waves. There's just a portion of it, but see, it's really like a torus. Now, I don't think you can generate that. If you want to generate it, you would have to put a peculiar thing at each end where you had uh, um, a peculiar dipoles at each end, and I don't know how to make those dipoles. So the only thing I could think of the use of this, well, if this thing was really like a torus and it's a self-sustained electromagnetic oscillation, maybe it's a model of an elementary particle. There's people who speculate that protons and neutrons and all that are just little vortices in the ether. Well, I've got a, a rigorous mathematical solution of 
Maxwell's equation that is a self-sustained longitudinal oscillation, uh, and it could be of any size. Maybe it could be small enough to be an elementary particle. I don't know. But anyway, i just given this to show that I did go to the Tesla meetings. But when cold fusion came out, I dropped my interest in the Moray stuff, and I dropped my interest in the Tesla stuff, and I changed to cold fusion for the next 23 years. If you go to Barnes & Noble, you buy a magazine that comes out every two months called Infinite Energy. You'll see I'm on the board of editors for the last 23 years. And I was invited by the American Chemical Society in 2010 to give a one-hour presentation at their annual meeting on what I claim is the only conventionally viable theory of cold fusion. So if anybody wants a copy, I'll send it to them. Uh, but anyway, now we come to the Schumann resonances. And if you look in uh, this book here, he shows how to make an approximate solution of the relevant equations. Now, these are the equations that you people are studying under Professor Lee right now. OK, here's the kind of an approximation he makes. Well, if I've got c, the velocity of light, divided by r, and r is between the surface of the Earth and the ionosphere, well, it's about 4,000 miles this way, about 40 miles that way, so it doesn't change very much. So instead of putting in R, I'm going to put in a constant, and that's an approximation. Now, this is what mathematicians call you know, a heuristic, H-E-U-R-I-S-T-I-C, uh, -E a heuristic approximation. You change the problem so you can solve it. And so finally, he comes out with a solution, and he comes out with a solution where the answer is something like this. It's like... Uh, uh, the velocity of light divided by the radius of the Earth multiplied by the square root of n times n plus 1, where n is an integer, 1, 2, 3, 4. And so if you look at the lowest four or five things, they come out to be 7 um, uh, hertz, 7 hertz, and 9 hertz, or whatever. But anyway, they vary like the square root of n times n plus 1, where n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you'll find that all explained in, in this book. OK. So now it says up here, uh, I copied it out of that book. The resonant frequencies are called Schumann resonances. They're extremely low uh, with A, that's the diameter of the Earth or the radius of the Earth. The first five resonant frequencies are 10.6, 18.3, 25.8, 33.3, and 409. Uh, Actually, uh, they came out later, uh, I think they'd go to 8 or something. But anyway, uh, here is experimental measurement. And here it says the Schumann resonances are at 8 hertz, 14 hertz, 20 hertz, and 26 hertz, and additional peaks at 32, 37, and 43 hertz. So that's the first seven of them. And they have been measured. And NASA has found that the Earth See, when you, when, when you solve them like this, you assume the surface of the Earth is a perfect metal conductor. You assume there's a vacuum. You assume the ionosphere is another perfect metal conductor. And so it's an idealized model. Well, it really should be a model of a, rev, uh, of a cavity with leaky boundaries, lossy boundaries. And NASA has found that the ionosphere is particularly lossy, and a lot of it gets through, more than people thought gets through. And they measure it out at 100 miles attitude or, or wherever. They, they have a, a satellite up there that is trying to predict uh, global problems like power outages and things like that. And it has been measuring these uh, things. And now they say, oh my goodness, they have the same frequencies as the Schumann resonances. So NASA has written a bunch of papers on it lately. Now, here is another way to do it. Uh, these are the people who measured the Schumann resonances at different places all over the world uh, simultaneously. Antarctica and uh, British Columbia and uh, Great Whale River, PG, wherever that is. I don't know where that is. Uh huh. OK. Now, uh, here they, they plotted it a different way. And from the slope, they said, these have to be the Schumann resonances because they're so similar. Um, and those are the E fields and the B fields. In the Schumann theory, uh, the B fields are just great circles going around the Earth, tangent to the Earth. Uh, but the E field points out radially everywhere. But the problem is the E field is reversing direction 
whereas the other one is always going in the same direction. And so to figure out an antenna to catch that and not take 200 kilometers like the quarter wavelength, but to do like Moray did and do it in 90 yards, that's a big project. And I hope somebody here will solve it. Maybe I'll live long enough to see somebody do it. I'm glad Professor Lee is an expert in designing antennas. Maybe he'll do it or have one of his students do it. Okay, now here's an actual eyewitness drawing of the antenna. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you know, it's not to scale because for, uh, this is a six foot high tent pole, a six foot high tent pole, and the distance between them is about 90 yards. Uh, no, 30 yards, about 90 feet. Uh, variously, they say 78 feet or 87 feet or whatever. But anyway, you can track that down in the book. And then there is a wire from the edge of the antenna that comes down to a box of electronics, and then a wire that goes from the electronics to a ground, and they pounded the ground 10 feet in. And the witnesses were allowed to pick an arbitrary spot in the desert 25 or 50 miles from the nearest power line, and it always worked. Um, now here is a copy of the patent application for a germanium triode, which the patent office said in 1927, a cold cathode is physically impossible and rejected his patent. So the poor guy, uh, he was cheated of a Nobel Prize that was given to three subordinates of Harvey Fletcher for a germanium and two gold strips. <clears throat> okay, the most credible witness of the Moray Val was the late Harvey Fletcher, 1884 to 1981 called the father of stereophonic sound and a longtime director of research at Bell Labs. While a student of Millikan, Fletcher had measured the charge on an electron in an oil drop experiment. That's the famous oil drop experiment. And Millikan got a Nobel Prize and all of Fletcher's friends said, well, you conceived the experiment. You did it with your own hands. You were cheated out of a Nobel Prize. So I am 82 years old. And I personally knew two of the three most important witnesses. Of course, all three witnesses are passed on now. But I knew the three most important witnesses, according to the book, three most important witnesses are Carl Eyring, Henry Eyring, and Harvey Fletcher. Now, when I was a professor of physics and astronomy at BYU, I worked in the Carl Eyring building, but he died not long before I got there. But he was a famous person, so I never met that famous witness. But I did meet Henry Eyring. And in fact, I got the job at BYU because Henry Eyring recommended me. And Henry Eyring was called, because of his rate reaction thing, he was called the most quoted chemist in the entire world. And the reason I say Henry Eyring is a Nobel caliber is because five minutes after he died, the telephone rang, and people calling from Switzerland, the Royal Swedish Royal Academy, said, well, We've just given the Nobel Prize in chemistry to Henry Eyring, and his relatives said, too bad he died five minutes ago. <laughs> anyway, uh, that happened this la past year, but instead of just giving it to the uh, runner-up the way they did with Eyring, they actually gave it to the person who died five minutes ago. So unfortunately, Henry Eyring did not get the Nobel Prize, but he knows for a fact that if they used the precedent of today, he would have gotten the Nobel Prize. So. Uh, Harvey Fletcher deserved the Nobel Prize given to Millikan, and Henry Eyring deserved the Nobel Prize that came five minutes after he died. Uh, and then the third witness was uh, Carl Eyring, and I worked in the Carl Eyring building. I never met him. But anyway, Henry Eyring was an emotional man, uh, and he recommended me, and I got a full professorship there, and I was there for 10 years. But one day I said something to him that really annoyed him. Uh, there was a whole audience sitting, and I was drawing on a board, and I was talking about controlled thermonuclear fusion. That's my topolitron patent. And I said, okay, here's the whole world. We're coming down the road, and we come to a fork in the road, and everybody in the world goes that way, and I go tiptoeing down that way. And Henry Eyring raised his hand. He, you say anything like that again, and I won't support you anymore. <laughs> but it's true. My colleagues who signed my patent on the Topolitron had PhDs from Harvard and Princeton and a Nobel Prize winner, and they agreed with my mathematically rigorous proof that my Topolitron would produce between 37 and 43 times more energy per unit volume than any possible tokamak. And today, the government of the United States, the government of Japan, and the government of the European Union are spending $10 billion to build a tokamak in France. Well, 
that if the tokamak in France is worth 10 billion, my Topolitron, whose patent has expired, should have been worth 370 billion. Anyway, uh, I did talk to uh, Harvey Fletcher when he was about 97 years old, and the year before he talked to me, allegedly to, quote, clear his conscience, he had signed an affidavit that it was true that he had seen this thing, and when people asked him about it, he changed the subject or he prevaricated because he was embarrassed to admit that he didn't know where Moray was getting the energy. But when he was on his deathbed, he signed an affidavit. Yes, it couldn't possibly have been a fraud. Moray was really producing between 3,500 and 50,000 watts of energy from nowhere. I don't know how he did it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, now, uh, I just showed you my paper on the longitudinal waves. In the 1980s, I gave papers at several conferences in honor of Tesla, in which I showed there's enough energy in the Schumann resonance in the Earth ionosphere cavity, which is replenished by lightning strikes. Now, I said here that one kilowatt, that's not true. I think it's like one microwatt or something. I've been going over that with Professor Lee, and uh, 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 we're trying to decide who to believe. There are people that say there's 500 uh, megajoules in a, in a lightning bolt and so on and so on. Uh, but anyway, uh, this one kilowatt should be one milliwatt or one microwatt. I think it's one milliwatt maybe more recently. Yeah. And that's huge energy too. You can multiply it by the uh, surface of the Earth. That's mind-boggling number. Oh yeah, and it's more, it's uh, three times more energy than all humanity consumes from every known power source. So if we could figure out, if anybody here could figure out how to tap into the Schumann resonances, or excuse me, the Fitzgerald Tesla Schumann resonances, then you would solve the Earth's uh, energy problem. Of course, the clouds are lifted by solar energy, and so the energy in lightning strikes comes ultimately from the sun. The problem is how to get a very high frequency AC current from a standing wave which is oscillating at about 8 hertz and in which the B field circles the entire Earth like an equator while the E field is always radial but continually reversing its direction. Conventional antenna theory for extremely low frequency, ELF, waves requires an antenna, I say here thousands of miles long, it could be as little as 200 kilometers if it's a quarter wave. Um, now here's my big conclusion. It seems to me there is some trick for getting around that proposition into which Moray had stumbled during invention of his radiant energy device without actually understanding what he'd done. He wrote about the sea of energy in which the Earth floats, and here's why I don't believe that it's zero-point energy, and here's why I respectfully disagree with a person whom I greatly admire and respect, uh, Moray King. Here's why I disagree with Moray King. Uh, two things. Um, Moray said the energy is not a simple oscillation. He says it comes in surges like ocean waves. It, zero point energy is uniform. It's uniform everywhere in the whole universe, and so it won't come in surges. Now, the second reason why I think it may be the Schumann resonances and not the zero point energy is that Moray said it's more energy in the daytime than at the nighttime. And NASA has found a big difference in the Schumann resonances in the daytime and the nighttime. But zero-point energy it d makes no difference what the weather is or what the daytime or nighttime. So it could be that instead of designing an antenna, you got to design something more like a microphone using my electromagnetosonic waves and take acoustic waves into account. So. I think Moray had done this without actually understanding what he'd done. He wrote about the sea of energy in which the Earth floats and said that the radiant energy comes in surges like oceanic tides, so one may need to go beyond the standard theory of the Schumann resonances by means of the theory of electromagnetosonic waves based upon uh, an electromagnetothermal, I left out the T, electromagnetothermal fluid dynamic EMTFD theory disclosed by me in the second one of my BYU Topolitron patents. And then I give an online reference. So uh, I hope that uh, someone here may, do, may make progress in this field. And uh, I thank Professor Lee for this opportunity. And may uh, someone here got interested, or Professor Lee get interested, and just keep in touch with me, and I can send you
copies of all the, I'll give you titles of all the books, and I can send you copies of all the papers. Do you have any questions or comments? Well, I have uh, one comment. So uh, in conclusion, you said uh, you, you have no doubt whatsoever there is enough energy in our atmosphere. I mean, it's not here, it's zero point energy. You think the energy is coming from human resonance. Yeah, yeah. Then how, how much confidence do you have, uh, you know, Dr. Murray collected the power? I mean, uh, I mean, can you, I mean, here's some situation that someone says yes and someone says no. I mean, how could you be uh, more affirmative when he collected like a 50 kilowatts? Well, he, uh, oh, I haven't told you all the drama in some of these books. Uh, in the early 1930s, when Roosevelt started the Rural Electrification Administration, the REA, it was later investigated by Congress, and it's not speculation, it's a proven fact. The REA was infiltrated by communist sympathizers. And the communist sympathizers brought a professor of physics all the way from Russia to look at what Moray was doing. And he says, it's real, it's not a fake. And so the REA was trying to learn the secret and send it to Russia. And so they told Moray, we'll give you a two-year contract. I talked to his son on the phone the other day, and he says, yeah, but Moray resigned before the two years was up. But anyway, they told Moray they would give him a PhD assistant for 24 months, and they would pay him $25 a day consulting fee for two years. In those days, that was big money. And so Moray started working with the assistant. Well, it turns out the assistant really was just trying to learn the secret so that he could tell the Russian professor or persuade Moray to move, emigrate to Russia. And so finally, toward uh, some, I have said it the last day of the 24-month contract, but Moray's son told me on the phone yesterday it wasn't the last day of the contract, it was just part way through the contract. But the Felix Fraser, who was the man from the REA trying to learn the secret to give it to the Russians, he went temporarily insane. He picked up a sledgehammer and he pounded the Moray radiant device to smithereens. And I asked Moray's son yesterday, was he ever able to rebuild it? And he said, no. He said, we never had the finances uh, to re rediscover it because he used rare things, like he had this thing he called a Swedish stone, which is a piece of germanium that he picked up when he was on a mission for the LDS church in Sweden. And uh, uh, he said it would take a lot, of, uh, a lot of financing and a lot of studying of crystals and everything to rediscover the exact thing. And it wasn't only the Moray valve, when he, when he demonstrated to witnesses, Moray would let the witnesses take everything apart, put it back together again except one little part. He kept that in his vest pocket. And when the witnesses would say, okay, we've studied everything, everything is fine, no batteries, no tricks, no nothing, then he would say, okay, I'm going to put the Moray valve in. He concealed it in his clenched fist and he would stick it into the box and back off and say, connect everything, and then he would get 3,500 watts. And they, all the witnesses here, yeah, it was 3,500 watts, and later it was raised to 10,000 watts, and finally 50,000 watts. But when Felix Fraser smashed Moray's thing, Moray was never able to get power again. And uh, uh, so the whole story is, is, is a tragedy. But uh, I think it's a historical fact that Moray got huge amounts of energy from nowhere with an antenna and a box of primitive crystal radio set ear electronics. So here's a challenge to everybody. Uh, rediscover. Rediscover the lost secret of the Moray radiant energy system. Can you comment about this patent issue, about the discovery? Uh, oh, about the patent issue. Uh, suppose, suppose someone actually find out oh. the, uh, the secrets. OK. Uh, all right, yes, yes. Uh, I passed the patent bar exam myself because uh, BYU spent about $500,000 getting my first Topolitron patent. And my second patent on the plasma sphere, I just did myself. I passed the patent bar exam. I studied every summer and finally passed it. Uh, and I can tell you this about patent law. There's a doctrine called um, lost art rediscovered. And here's an example of a lost art rediscovered. If you get a statue of an ancient Roman wearing a toga, you look at it carefully, there's a safety pin. But somebody in modern times rediscovered the safety pin, got a patent on it because the art had been lost. Nobody in the thousand years in between the Romans had used safety pins. So there is a legal doctrine that everybody accepts called uh, the patentability of a lost art rediscovered. 
So if we rediscover what Moray did, we could get a patent on it. Now, as far as my own work goes, I handed out my business card. If anybody knows an inventor that wants to work, I would love some work. I'll do high quality work for half the price that anybody else charges. So, but anyway, um, I, I, the only thing, if an investor came to me and said, I want you to try to rediscover the Moray thing, I couldn't promise him I'd rediscover the Moray thing, but I could promise him just one thing. I could get a patent on, quote, um, a method and procedure for more accurate modeling of the resonances in the Earth ionosphere cavity. Because I would use my EMTFD equations, those uh, six degree equation that factors into three polynomials, two of which Alfin got the Nobel Prize for. The third quadratic equation, you get its complex roots, and it tells you a sinusoidal wave that's exponentially decaying. And uh, uh, I am sure I can get a patent on that because I can prove that two world famous experts tried it and I, in my patent I pointed out mistakes they made. There's a man who won the Nobel Prize in astrophysics called Chandrasekhar. And Chandrasekhar told his best student, S.K. Trehan, I want you to work this thing out. Take this six by six determinant and expand it, you know, and go all these equations. And somewhere, um, Trehan made a mistake. And I have uh, six copies of a book at home because I thought I might have six collaborators one day. I got six copies of an of a out of print book, rare out of print book, that has a chapter by S.K. Trehan where he tried to derive it and made an algebraic mistake. And then this professor at uh, MIT, Bruno Coppi, he made an algebraic mistake. Guess what his mistake was? There are five uh, physical factors and one geometrical factor. The five physical factors are the thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, hydrodynamic viscosity, the reciprocal of the speed of light taken not to be uh, zero. Uh, uh, that's four physical constants. And the fifth thing is a <coughs> geometrical constant called the Helmholtz number. The Helmholtz number, a mathematician like me would say, it's just the eigenvalue of the Laplacian operator in the cavity that you're looking at. And I, I have to say to people before they ask questions, I'm a trained mathematician, but I'm just an amateur engineer, an amateur physicist. But anyway, uh, uh, if you have the Helmholtz number and you have those four physical constants, then you can write down these equations. Now, here's the mistake that Copy made. He said, I'm going to take these one at a time and put them equal to zero, and it makes the equation simpler, and then I work it out and get the answer, and then I got uh, four different answers, and then I'm just going to interpolate between the four answers. But that's wrong. Here's why it's wrong. I have proven, already proven, that the constant term in the six degree polynomial is a product of those four factors and the geometrical factor. So if any one of them is zero, you change the order of the polynomial from six to fifth, and so there's a linear factor, and that linear factor is just what they call an entropy wave. And so it, it, you can't possibly get the right answer. So when Copy thought he would simplify the problem and, uh, and interpolate between four or five simpler problems, he was making a, a tragic mistake. And I tried to tease him by sending him a copy of the real answer, and he claims, I don't remember getting it, and I don't have it if I did get it. But anyway, um, I'm hot on the trail of deriving those equations again. And I used to tell people, uh, if you give me enough money that I could work for one year, I, I'd do it. Now I'm telling people I don't need that much money. I'm getting closer. <laughs> so do you have, by any chance, any record whatsoever Dr. Murray did? I mean, is there any uh, a written document how Murray designed his uh, device? Uh, this thing here is full of documents and signed affidavits. The only thing wrong in this book, I'm about to. T uh, He's got some pages of electromagnetic theory with a lot of misprints. I spent several hours writing it all down. I'm about to send his son. But his son was kind enough. He has a conclusion by R.W. Bass. He has a new foreword by R.W. Bass. But he says somewhere, we don't necessarily agree with the opinions of R.W. Bass. Uh, his father thinks that uh, he needs $5 million to for go through Moray's original 1940 plan of going to Germany and Sweden and everything and collecting all these uh, crystals and doing this and that and the other. In other words, Moray was having a big, big plan to make his Moray valve more reliable because Moray admitted that something in his system burned out after 200 hours. 
And it wouldn't be commercially valuable unless it would run for a thousand hours or so. And it always burned out after 200 hours. So uh, Moray was always trying to get enough money to study how to make it more reliable, and that's what the sun is trying to do. I think the sun is on the wrong track. The sun. I think the sun shouldn't be trying to r figure out how to do a transistor. I think we can, if we know the specifications, today's physics is so advanced, we can design a transistor that does anything you tell it to do. The real problem is what Professor Lee is trying to do is circuit design and uh, the, 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 the uh, electromagnetic way to tap into some electromagnetic waves in a cavity that we know are there. Comments, questions? Wait, there is one thing that I want to put. Yes, go ahead. I was just going to ask. So you mentioned that if we did have an antenna that would be able to do this, it would have to be really long on the scale of like 200 or more kilometers or so. So if we did have something, a structure like that built, would we be able to um, recreate what Moray did? I suppose so. I See, I'm not really an expert on antennas. You asked Professor Lee, but I have heard the phrase quarter wavelength. The standard antenna is a quarter of a wavelength. And so if a quarter of the wavelength is 200 kilometers, you've got to start with a 200 kilometer long antenna. I think uh, you have a very valid question, but the problem is when you make an antenna long, you have losses involved. Uh, so the making the antenna small and the capture over large area, we call it suspected area, that can be a challenge. So uh, I would say the answer is it's possible, but we don't know how. Maybe that's what Dr. Murray did. He actually did the antenna small enough to collect enough power rather than making, it's not more, actually it's more than 200 kilometers. It's gonna be several hundred kilometers to make it effective antenna. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna have a huge losses. See, we have an energy that is uh, less than a few milliwatts within say per meter area. Okay, so consider the, uh, the, the wire that has a conduction and losses involved and by the time you collect the power from all these structures, you may be negligible. So the, the key here is maybe any of you can have some idea how to make this antenna small and collect enough power without too much losses. I think that's the key here. So my, my thinking is it is possible, but we don't know yet. Actually, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And the key here is if you find what it is, we can make a lot of money because <laughs> it is protected according to his uh, knowledge in Pat and Mall. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you are serving humanity and uh, you may get a Nobel Prize, maybe more than a few times. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's interesting, but it's, uh, it's, it's something to be grasped that isn't in our hands. <laughs> okay, do you have any questions, comments? Oh, by the way, I invited a reporter from the Star Telegram. Is the reporter from the Star Telegram here? Well, okay. Apparently, well, we he can didn't do come. that once uh, this is recorded. All right, you you're going to yeah. put it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, well, just one last comment here. He has more or less a physics background, and uh, we are more like an engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we study this electromagnetics, we always talk about E and H. But he's doing E and B. So that's <laughs> a difference between physics and electrical engineering. Yeah. Okay, so I want you aware of that. You know the convention of E to G omega T? He's using E to plus I omega T. That's one difference between physics and electrical engineering. And another difference is uh, we are using E and H, not E and B. Mm -hmm. H and B are related. Mm -hmm. and we call it permeability. But the way you present the data, oh, yeah. you usually use B, E, engineers using H. Yes. So I want you aware the difference is here. Right. right. OK, any okay. questions or comments? Well, uh, if you don't have any questions, let's give a lot of applause. <laughs> and uh, yeah, today I give you an early release so that you can enjoy it nice weather in the outside. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming by. I'll see you on Monday. Mm -hmm. now, let's pack up everything yeah. in my bag.